Uh, you can do pretty much anything you want to do. And um, but tonight, I uh, I have something that the Lord impressed on my heart to talk about. I wish there were more people here. You know, a lot of times you wish that, and it's I guess that's a natural thing. There's a lot of times that. I guess, you you know, I've compared it to eating food or preparing food. I've thought to myself, you know, if you prepared a really good meal or you felt like God had really given you something good to make or something new to try, you know, you wish that more people could enjoy it. You know what I mean? Imagine if you had put something in the oven, Sister Linda, and you really, you know, thought it was going to turn out good and was needed, you know, for the body. You'd want more people to be there, and that's kind of the way I feel a lot of times, but I just look at it like this. Those that are here, they're here, and there's some that are listening on the Internet. And my heart goes out to people because I realize tonight there's a lot of folks in need tonight. There's a lot of people. And I want to talk to you from a subject that I believe will, will speak to your heart tonight. And that's what I feel like God's led me here to do. We're going to turn to the book of Deuter- Deuteronomy tonight, chapter number 2. And we're going to start with verse 1. Brother Eric. Do you do you like to read? Are you okay with reading? Are you? Much? I know some people don't. Look. You want to help me? You want you want to help me tonight? If it's Esau, that sounds good to me. It's Deuteronomy chapter two. We're going to start with verse one. We're going to read through to verse four. You feel like reading for me tonight? You will give it a shot. If you come up to Esau and you can't pronounce it, just say like one preacher did, elephant. If it starts with a P, you can just say pineapple. Just don't say pina colada. So Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 1. <laughs> and we're going to read to verse 4. If everyone has it, say amen. How many of you tonight really would like for the Lord to give you some direction and speak to you? Well, listen, um, I may not... I always say this, and it always turns out different. I may not run the aisles tonight and whatnot, but I really, I really feel like God wants to speak to us tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Go ahead, Brother Eric, and read for the Lord tonight. Amen. One of the things that I want us to pay close attention to, and this is where I feel like the Lord has led us to primarily. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 1. You got it there in front of you. And there's a word here that I'm looking at, and I want you to see this. The Bible said, then we turned, excuse me, and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. As the Lord spoke unto me, and we compassed Mount Seir many days. We compassed Mount Seir many days. And now notice what the Lord says there. And the Lord spoke unto me, saying, You have compassed this mountain long enough. And what does he say to do? Turn you northward. I'd like to preach with the Lord's help a message that I don't believe I've ever preached on or talked about. And I may preach, speak, exhort. I don't know. I just want to feel this out tonight and obey the Lord. But I want to talk to you on the next chapter. The next chapter is what the Lord laid on my heart tonight. Sister Amanda, would you say blessing over the word that we're going to?
Amen. You may be seated in the next chapter. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want you to pay close attention tonight because I feel like the Lord may just talk to someone here. There may be someone listening on the internet. I don't know, but I believe somebody needs to hear this, if not all of us. What exactly could we call or consider a chapter? Uh, I know some of us may think we have an idea, and some of us may be pretty bright, and you may have it all figured out. But what exactly is a chapter? You know, when you really break it down and you think about a chapter, uh, a lot of times people will identify a chapter as a period, a period of time. It's often looked at as a season, a chapter when you look at it in the perspective that we're going to talk about it tonight. A chapter can be a cycle of significant events. Now, I know that change is received by everyone in a different capacity. Over the years, I've noticed that everybody takes change differently. Some people look forward to change while other people despise change. One of the things I've noticed is that over a period of time as I've gotten older, and you, I've shared this, so most of you, this isn't foreign, but... As I've got older, I appreciate stability more than I ever have. When I was a young man, I, I was running here, running there, doing this and that, and I always liked something new, something improved, something different, you know. But as I've got older, the one thing I have appreciated, I like stability. I like things that are not here today and gone tomorrow. I don't like things that are a passing has been. I, I like things that, are, that stick around for a while. I have a greater appreciation for that. And you know that there are little things that we may not think much about that uh, if we were to change up on you, some of you might even get upset. But, I mean, there are some things that for me, I've been doing a certain way for so long that when it gets changed up, sometimes it can mess me up altogether, mess me up. I mean, there, there have been times before, you see, for me, I can give you just a small example, little things. You know, for I don't know how many years now, but I've been using the same deodorant for who knows how many years? My body probably is adapted to this stuff that I use. And I, there have been times before that I went to the store and I looked and I didn't even see it on the shelf. I'm like, oh, Lord, please don't tell me I got to change the oven. I got to use something different, you know. And I just, because the older that you get, you get used to using a certain thing. You don't, you despise change. You don't want, you don't want anything different. You like what you use. And if it were truth be told tonight, there's some of you that if I ask you, you got certain things you like. And you like it a certain way. I mean, it might be Charmin. It might be the Pillow Top Plus. I don't know what it is. But there are certain things that I know that you like that you don't want to deviate from. If you like sardines and you like a certain brand or, you know, you go to a certain restaurant, you order the same thing every time you go. There are some of us, and I find that the older that we get, the more settled and the more procured that we become, that we know what it is we like. And I find the older we get, the more that we can come to a place where we despise change. We don't, we don't like change. Now, when you're younger, you like the spontaneity of change, like new things, new faces, new, new places, and all of that. You know, I'm to the point in my life with a, with a career, with job, you know, in my marriage, I don't want change. I don't want another one. I like the one I got. I want to stick with what I have now. I don't need another one. You know what I'm saying? I like things like they are. I don't want no change. And so I find that everybody receives change differently. And, and these do new or, or new places or new chapters of their life. And I'm not always talking about a complete overhaul of change. Sometimes God will bring us into a new season or a period or chapter of our life that, that some things are changed. Some things may be significantly changed than what they used to be. And I find that that when we start getting older physically, like, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old, or even me at going on 43 years old, I still don't like a lot of things different. But I can tell you this, that even the same way in the spirit, the farther that I go spiritually mature, I don't like a lot of up and down. I don't like a lot of different things. I like it like it is, you know. And I'm not talking about being not being open to, to God moving or revival. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that I'm not open to God doing bigger, brighter, better things. I don't mean that. I'm just saying as far as I like where I'm at, I don't want to move all over the place. I, I don't want to pastor here six months and then over there for two years and over 
there for a year and a half, over there five years and back over so and so. I just don't, I'm, I don't feel like I'm in a place in my life that I want to do that. Now, if God told you to do that, that'd be a different story. But I find that in God, I mean, this is my experience. I can't say that this is biblically based. So you take this for what it's worth. I'm just going to pre-qualify you. But in my personal experience and evaluation, rarely have I ever seen God bounce somebody all over the place and it be the will of God. I've rarely ever seen that because here's what I find is that the more you, the, the more that you are where you are doing what you are doing, the more vitality that you can have and strength where you're at because the, take it like this, for example, I preached on this before, but if you take plants and you pluck them up out of the dirt and you plant it somewhere else, every time that you pluck that plant up out of the ground, if you do it frequently, that plant can go through a state of shock and can actually die. And so it's not good for the plant. The longer that you leave it, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, the longer that you leave that plant alone and allow the roots to go down, allow the roots to get deep, the more that that plant is able, when it's properly pruned, to bear fruit, the more it's able to produce, the stronger it gets, and the more stability that it has because of its roots. And you know, it's the same way with a child of God. And so there's good reason for a mature Christian not to like a lot of change because you understand the more that I uproot and replant, uproot and replant, the more I start over. Is anybody besides me? I don't like to move either. I don't like all that packing and stuff is for the birds. I mean, the longer you stay somewhere, the more you've accumulated stuff and all that packing is for the birds. I mean, everybody may want a new place and all that, but some folks are saying they get up in their age and say, you know what? We're comfortable where we're at. We're content where we'd like to have a nicer place, but I think we'll just stay right where we are. So I think I made the point tonight that not everybody receives change the same way. Can you say, man, you might wonder how much significance that has what I want to talk about tonight, but it does. And I want you to see exactly where the Lord took me. You see, when we think of chapters tonight, we're probably most all acquainted with chapters in a book or a story or a novel. You know, when we, when we look at some of the most well-seasoned writers and authors of novels and books over the years, there's a school of, a th- of thought and advice that you will find. If you search the internet, you'll find the same exact thing. But many of these experienced and seasoned writers, they will tell you that, that or they will explain that they put a lot of emphasis on chapters and, and helping break up the monotony of the chain of events. If you talk to a well-seasoned writer, they will even tell you that in the day that we're living in, that people's attention span doesn't seem to be quite what it was years ago. So even in this generation, more than any other generation, there needs to be chapter breaks. There needs to be a, a place where the, there's a break in what's going on in the story to captivate that person's attention. And so not only that, but if you you talk to some of these writers, most of them will advise you that a chapter completed, it represents the platform for things to come in the next chapter. Uh, if you if you really look and you follow along the writing style or pattern of a well-seasoned writer, you will begin to notice that when they are approaching a chapter, everything that they just wrote about is often building up so that they can make that nut, that awesome uh, a transition into the next chapter of that of that story of that novel and so everything that that they build up to in chapter 2 or chapter 3 when they're in chapter 1 everything in chapter 1 is to set the stage or the platform or the launching pad for everything we're going to hear about and learn about in chapter 2 in other words it can be so deep and it can be so built upon the premise of what just took place in the first chapter or what you're going through right now that if you miss chapter one you won't even understand what happens in chapter two are you understanding what I'm saying and so everything has its perfect place and time one preacher that I know of he's a great preacher and he had an outline one time that he'd shared I never read it but he just told me about this outline it spoke to my heart and he talked about how and I've heard other preachers allude to this but it's powerful stuff 
He said that a lot of Pentecostal churches uh, are stuck in Acts chapter 2. And they, they're stuck there. They never moved on past they're, they're in Acts chapter 2, but they're not in Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 4, church, they got stuck in one place. And so we cannot get stuck in a place, but sometimes God has transitional periods of places in our life where God is about to take us from here and take us to here where God says okay you were right here but I'm about to move you closer to chapter 5 of your life you see you you may have been in chapter 2 for the last 6 months but God said I'm taking you closer to chapter number 9 but before I can get you to chapter 9 I gotta take you through 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8 and so you gotta be patient while I work on the clay cause I'm gonna get you to chapter whatever but you gotta deal with whatever your chapter you're in right now and so a lot of times God is allowing that chapter to build up for the next place or the next space or the next season or the next breakthrough or the next uh, period of your life can you say amen to me tonight and so not only that but other writers will advise us that a chapter is a set of events that had to take place to go together before something else could take place well when I got thinking about that that's just really another way of saying that it's a platform for things to come in the next chapter. I'm going to say it again. Other writers will advise that a chapter is nothing more than a set of events or a series of events that had to all fit together before something else could take place. And in my opinion, that just goes right along with some of the first advice and some of the first experience, which is it's just a platform for things to come together for the next chapter of your life. You may be looking at your life right now and you say, I don't understand last year or I don't understand the last five years of my life. But God said, I had to take you through the last five years for me to take you where I'm about to take you. There were things that had to fall into place long before I could ever get you to right here. You had to go through the fire and the flood before that you ever became with it. You ever had skin that was thick enough to take on what I'm about to put you through or the place I'm about to take you. You see, as a child of God, you're going to face all of the, the, the fiery darts of the enemy. And sometimes before God can take you through a deeper place of hot, fiery trials and, and use you in a greater capacity, God has to allow you to face trials in chapter 2 so that your, your skin, your spiritual skin, gets a little thicker. Your spiritual mind gets a little bit wiser. And your spiritual heart heart gets a little bit more anointed so that God can use you where he's about to take you to. You cannot look at your situation and say, I am stuck here. Because if you want to be stuck there, that's your own business. But God's not going to leave you in chapter 3 if he's going to take you to chapter 11. God said, I'm going to take you. You just got to be patient. I've got a time. I've got a place. I've got a will and I've got a way. And if you've made up your mind that you'll follow me to the day that you die hang on to your seatbelt because we're about to go into the next chapter we're about to go into the next place we're about to go into a phase uh, and a season where you're going to understand when you put all the pieces to the puzzle together and you say I don't even know how God did it but somehow he did it uh, I don't know how piece A went but piece B and I still can't figure out how that I got where I'm at tonight I still don't even understand all this but do you know what the Bible said? He said, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. He said, I'll direct your path. Did you hear that? I'll direct your path. I'm telling you tonight, uh, you may not understand it. You may can't put your finger on it. You may not be able to write a book about it, uh, but can I tell you, God knows your story better than anybody. And God said, hang on for the next chapter. Can you say amen tonight? Praise the Lord. I'll tell you one of my favorite piece of writing advice is this as it pertains to chapters. It said that chapter breaks should take place when there is a need for a shift. I want you to think about that for a minute. When you get to that place where that you have stalled, where that you have, thank you, Holy Ghost, where that you have been in neutral, 
Anybody know how to drive a stick shift or manual? And you know, you push in the clutch and between gears, you got that between first and between second, between third and fourth, between fourth and fifth. There is often a pause, unless you're a speed racer, ain't much of a pause. But when you begin to push that clutch in uh, and you're transitioning from third gear to fourth gear, or you're about to hit overdrive uh, and you're going from fourth to overdrive and fifth, when you push that clutch in, uh, there may be a period of neutral or a period of idle and you said, I have not understood this period of my life. I have not understood that season. It doesn't make a lick of sense to me, but God said you were between fourth and fifth. He was between third and fourth. If you'll just hang on, I'm about to put you in another gear. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost. Sometimes you need another. It, it, those, those chapter breaks come when there's a need, a great need for a shift. Huh? Uh, you ever taught somebody how to drive a stick shift? That can be entertaining. All that bucking and jerking. Roo, 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 roo. Huh? And you get it halfway in between gears. Run! The engine's rev way up. Yeah, about to blow the engine up. And then they're going to just about dry start the, uh, the clutch and peel out of the pocket. Next thing you know, you're wondering what in the world just happened. Hey Amen. Like it popped starting the clutch. Right? You see, you can sit there with the clutch spinning several thousand RPMs uh, and it's time for a shift. Did you hear me? You're sitting there in neutral and you're not going anywhere. You might have had just enough uh, to keep you coasting uh, before you ever got to this place. Uh, and so you're coasting and you're coasting and you're coasting but you find yourself here lately. It's almost like your coast is almost gone. Come on somebody. If you've coasted as far as you can go you're in one of those places of your life. You need a shift more than you've ever needed one because all it'll take you hear me somebody all it's going to take is one good shift and everything will be back to normal. Oh! Feel the Holy Ghost tonight. You see, we can see God is leading his people in our text to their next chapter. Some of you, you've read it. I've read it. I've preached on it before. But Canaan was the initial and the ultimate goal of God's people. God wanted to take them from their bondage to their blessing. God wanted to take them to their prison all the way over to their paradise. God said, I'm taking you to Canaan land. That was the initial goal. But when we find them in the word of God, the Lord says then to them, you have compassed or compassed this mountain long enough. The word compass is a very important word. It was properly translated from the original when they translated it because it fully and expressly explains the original text to come pass. In other words, whatever that mountain looked like on the top, I've often preached it and thought of it like this. Brother Mike, it's kind of like your life seems like the same old scenery. Oh, there it is. Same old rock I passed yesterday. Oh, there's that bottle of anointing oil. I've seen that last night. Oh, there's that chair. I see that every week. Here's some more of that carpet. I'm tired of seeing this stuff. How you doing, Mike? I've seen you a few times. Hallelujah. Same old scenery. When you can pass, a lot of things become monotonous in your life. You see, God didn't call them to come pass a mountain. God brought them to where they were at because of their murmur and the complaining. They didn't go straight to Canaan like they should have. Listen, if I can stop and pause for just a second, sometimes you're where you are because of somebody else is doing. Sometimes you're where you're at because of your own doing. Sometimes because of decisions you made. Well, this ain't where I'd like to be. Sometimes if you sit down and do a spiritual audit, you might find out you're where you are because of your decisions to be where you are. 
You might have made certain decisions along the way that have kept you in that place where you are mentally, spiritually, and sometimes even physically. What I'm telling us tonight is that God wanted to take them to Canaan. But because of their murmuring, complaining, they went up by the way of Kadesh Barnea. And the next thing you know, they're compassing Mount Seir. Many days, the same old stuff, week after week after week. They're in that neutral. They're in between gears, so to speak. And they're not really accomplishing anything. Do you know you don't accomplish a whole lot when you're just walking in circles? You hear me, somebody? It's the same old stuff. I'm doing the same. Same thing I've always, but I'm not accomplishing nothing. That is an overlay of many of the lives of God's people. And I believe tonight on the authority of the word of God that that's rarely ever God's will for your life. You see, I understand that sometimes there has to be a Mount Seir experience before God can take you to your Canaan. I understand that. But there are some people that they are content to compass Mount Seir. They're content to be in a place of being idle. I don't know about you, but I've said it over and over. Man, I remember what Pentecostal fire felt like. I remember what it felt like to have the Holy Ghost all over you. And it was so like that you just got absolutely saturated in the very presence of God. And there's nothing else it'll do for me. You can have your library services. But for me, and like Joshua said, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve God. Can you say amen, somebody? You see, they had previously attempted to go by the way of Cadiz Barnea, but the Lord shows them their need to turn northward to get to Canaan. To me, it would appear as though that God finally gets to the place. And he says, Not only have you compassed this mountain long enough, you've been here where you're at long enough. You've been in this state of mind. You've been in this place in your spirit long enough. Sometimes whenever you stay in that state of mind, in that place of, of mentality or spiritual place, not only do you miss the reward that would be up ahead, but you often fall deeper and deeper into becoming more and more cold, more callous, more lukewarm, unaffected, unsensitive to the Spirit. Whereas the places or parts or seasons of your life when you were in fourth gear, all that took was a little breath of the Holy Ghost and you felt the movement of the Spirit. You were so sensitive to the tremble of the, of the Spirit. If I could say it that way, the, the little Holy Ghost tremors, you were so sensitive you could pick up on it. It was like some kind of special radar. You knew when it was holy. You could feel it when the Spirit of God began to move. Uh, and some of you might say, well, if the Holy Ghost moved right now, I could feel it. But there's some of you been serving God for a while. You know what I'm talking about there's a big difference whenever you are attached I and mean, then right to him hip to hip you understand what I mean and a place where you're walking at a distance from God I didn't say you was backslid I just said there are some times uh, that you can be walking at a distance uh, and that fire ain't burning like it once was uh, and a lot of times uh, it's because you've been where you're at way too long Somebody here tonight say, God, I'm ready for whatever you want to do in my life. Amen. I didn't plan to preach a long time tonight, but I did plan to obey God. So you just bear with me. But in the next chapter, some things stay the same while other things must change. Did you get that? There's a few points that I want to make that I want to take the time to drive that nail in real deep. There are some chapter changes in your life for the next chapter that some things will remain the same, but there are some things that must change. When I look back at the children of Israel, 
When I look back at God's people, it's easy to tell that because God took them in another place, He wasn't changing their clothes. Maybe in another portion of the scripture, like Jacob when he changed his name, and he said uh, he was going to call him Israel because he had power with God. But this ain't this story. In this story, I don't remember anybody's name got changed. So they got the same name. They got the same families. They're, they're traveling in the same company. A lot of things are still the same. But for the next chapter of their life, something had to take place. And when I began to pray about this and seek the Lord, the Holy Ghost spoke this to me to me, and said, direction will not always require a new location. Sometimes it does. But the greatest chapter change is direction. That has got to settle down in our soul. The greatest chapter change of your life will simply be direction. Sometimes God will move your location. But always chapter change will bring direction. There's a lot of things I could say it's not. But there's one thing I know it is. How do I know? Because of the word of God and what the Holy Ghost showed me when I began to study and pray. Because when you receive a change and God said, I'm taking you to the next chapter, the next place, the next season, for you to do so, God has to give you direction. How do you know, Brother Myers? Well, when I look at this portion of the Bible, God gave them specific direction. When he said, it's time for you to turn northward, I don't got time to preach every dynamic of this scripture, and I've covered this before, but for what it's worth, how many knows what direction north is? Up. I mean, we could preach there all night, but here's here's the thing. God says to them, I want you to go up by this way. When you get over here, these people are going to be afraid of you. Go back, read it. I don't have time to tell you the whole entire thing, but I will say this. God was specific. God was detailed. And I believe that God will be specific and God will be detailed about the next chapter of your life if you seek Him. The Bible said God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Let me tell you one of the reasons why that people flock to what some call in this modern day era, they call it prophecy. And it ain't no more prophecy than my big toe's my little toe. Come on now. You see, if you look at the Bible, I ain't got time for all this, but if you look at the Bible, prophecy in the Word of God was every time I've ever read it was a foretelling of God's judgment in most every case or some future event that God was going to do. What they call prophecy today. You're married, ain't you? Yes, sir. I knew it. I just knew it. Yeah, okay. Your back's been giving you trouble. Whose back ain't giving them some trouble? Huh? You've been having trouble sleeping at night. Boy, you just hit about 75% of the crowd right there, didn't you? Captain Obvious, is that what they say? Some of what they call prophecy today ain't nothing more than glorified guessing. They do a good job of that down the carnival. Come on, somebody. I don't need somebody to tell me that I got something jacked up with my back. I don't need somebody to tell me I got a corn on the side of my big toe. I don't need somebody to tell me. Come on, somebody. I need somebody to tell me what's true, what's right. I need some direction in my life. You're going to prophesy over me. Tell me what God's plan is. You see... When you, if you want to fill up a church and if you want to pack it out like Sister Roland said, just get you somebody to come prophesy or what they, that's what they call prophesy because people are lazy. Do you hear what I just said? Oh, I don't say it well, Brother Myers. Don't call nobody lazy. I said people are lazy. They want somebody to come by and say, 
in three months, two days, and 24 hours and 16 minutes, God is going to do. Usually, what they'll say, God's going to do something big. What is it going to be? That's what I want to know. What is it going to be? It's going to be big. Mm. I'm not saying that God can't move like that. But is anybody else sick to their gut with all the generalities and stuff that's out there? I mean, that don't put anybody in any kind of a position where they really are in jeopardy of either being in or out of God's will. They can stand up and say, Yea, the Lord said, I'm about to do a big thing. And that's not controversial at all. But if they stood up and said, Yea, I, the Lord said, and he said in whatever, 24 hours and 7 minutes, I'm going to do thus and so. Boy, if that don't come to pass, you're, you know, you're in a pretty big mess, ain't you? Huh? So people deal with generalities. This is the truth. The whole internet land may fall out with me here, but most folks are going to agree with me because there's a lot of folks that just sick to their guts with all this fake stuff. Anybody hate fakery? I just can't stand all this false, phony, baloney stuff. Either it is or it ain't God, right? But what I'm telling you is people are lazy. They'd rather have somebody come. That's why they flock to that stuff. Tell me whether she's going to stay with me. Tell me whether I'm going to lose this job. Tell me what my paycheck's going to be next week because you know that I need that brand new PlayStation just came out. Huh? I'm really wanting to get that brand new car. Tell me about next week. People are lazy. You see, he said, seek the Lord. He said he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And what I'm telling you tonight is that God has direction. Anybody here, I wish I'd have had one tonight. Anybody ever seen a blueprint before? I use them on the job all the time. I wish I had brought one tonight because God already... Boy, this is going to hit some of you right square in the forehead. God already has your blueprint made out. It's your job to find out what's on it. Do you want to know? I'm just sitting back. I'm just letting this go. I got to close here in a minute, but you know some folks, I'm thinking to myself about this story here. What if these people would have took the approach that some folks take today? I'm going to let it play out. I'm going to let it play out however, however, if it's God's will now, it's going to happen. No, because God told them specific things. And what would happen if they didn't follow them specific things? The same old mess that got them where they're at right now in the text. You don't want to follow God's perfect plan. And if you're not willing to seek after God then you have no right to complain and bellyache later on because things are bad. But I believe with all of my heart, I'm not here to try to give a prophetic word. I'm just telling you what I felt in my spirit. But this is what the Lord has been speaking to me all day long, the next chapter. God looks down and He sees a people compassing a mountain, just continually going around and around and around and around. And he says, you've compassed this mountain. Not that one over there. Not this one over here. You've compassed this mountain. So whatever this mountain is, he said, you're done with this mountain. It's time to move away from this mountain. It may be another mountain you encounter on your way to Canaan, but it's time to move past this place of compassing. Because if you don't, you're going to be in a frame of mind where it's just like this. Sometimes when God brings you to a new chapter, some things stay the same, but there will always be something that will have to change. You see, God could easily take me and my wife. I'll use us as an example before I close tonight to make my point. God would easily use us to bring about a new chapter in our life. If I had a dollar for every time somebody told me, Ooh, God is about to do this. God is about to do that. I'd be rich. But here's the thing. God can keep me and Sister Myers... Right where I'm at, 
if that's his will, and I believe it is, he can keep me right where I'm at and change a lot of the other dynamics to bring me into a new chapter of my life. It's possible. You see, Sister Tracy, about two Sunday school lessons ago, her first Sunday school lesson, very powerful, very pivotal. Could have been could have been used as material for a camp meeting message. But the summary of what she was talking about there was and had to do with the fact that we a lot of times want to live in the past. Yesterday's breakthroughs, yesterday's good times, yesterday's ministries. And she talked about how she went through our Facebook and and mentioned numerous ministries that have been started, numerous things that have happened since we've been here and since she's been here and since other people have been here. You and I could sit around and bellyache about all this. Well, what about that ministry? What about the time we did this? What about the time we did that? When God brings you into a new chapter, you thank God for the blessings of yesterday. You learn from the hard lessons of yesterday. But when God brings you to a new chapter, you step through some new doors and you make the most of today. I can look back and say, well, there was a time that I remember having 94 people in this sanctuary for a youth night service where we went out and knocked on doors and everything else. Who's to say that God may not have a chapter later on down the road where it might be twice that number or it might be half that number. None of that matters. What matters is that I've got direction. I said what matters is that I've got direction for the next chapter. You see, I can sit around and say this thing's going to play itself out. But if you haven't prayed and if you don't want to know, you probably won't. I want to say this and I'm closing. Stand to your feet. That way I know I will. I've often referred back to this song and I like it pretty well. Someone want to come to the piano for me? I don't have that many piano player system, man. I'm sorry. You may have to come help me here. And over the years, I have referred or referenced this song, but there's a, there's a black gospel song that I really like a lot, and it's by an artist by the name of Bishop Paul Morton. And he says in this song, whatever you're doing in this season or this storm, don't do it without me what a deep thought because sometimes Sister Reba we're going through a trial and we're so bogged down and burdened down by everything that's going on we cave in we complain we gripe we grumble but but the song says whatever you're doing in this storm whatever you're doing in this hard place in my life don't do it without me I might have to go, I might have to hobble, I might have to drag myself along some days. But whatever you're doing, don't do it without me. And see, the whole premise, Brother Eric, is simply this. You remember whenever you was in school, you ever do retake tests? Whether you fail a test, got to go back and do the... You see, sometimes God will allow you and me to go through tests of our life. And maybe you've been in neutral between fourth and fifth gear for a while. Sometimes those tests that come along in our life, we got so hurt during the test. We got so hurt during the storm. We got our eyes on everything else. But God said, I've been trying to teach you something in this storm. And so because you haven't learned and you haven't paid attention, you're going to have to retake that test all over. And some people wonder and they say, why does it seem like I just got out of a... Are y'all listening to me? Why does it seem like I just got out of a storm? It seems like it's like one trial back to back to back. I'm not saying this is exactly the reason, but folks, you've got to take within yourself and wonder, is it because God, you've been trying to show me something, but I've been so carried away and cumbered about and I've been busy with so many things going on in my life, and I've been so frustrated and hurt, and I've let depression nearly choke me to death. Depression will reach in there and just choke every bit of spiritual energy and life that you have out of you. Discouragement and everything else. 
But you don't have to retake this test. You can fall on the altar tonight and you can say, Lord, Brother Eric, you could look at the Lord. You could say, I submit myself to God. I'm resisting the devil that he'll flee from me. I surrender. I surrender everything to you tonight. While I'm down here, Lord, I want you to give me some direction. If this new chapter means I'm going to be doing some other thing I've never done in you, I'm going to need need some advice, Lord. I'm going to need some help. Let's do this thing together, God. Because if you'll reach out to Him, He's always been good to reach right back. But a lot of times we get so hurt and we're in the middle of what we're going through, we don't feel like reaching for nothing but the handrail. Brother Joey Hyatt, phenomenal preacher. He passed away here a few weeks back. He preached a message I'll never forget. He preached on let go of the handrail. Sometimes that handrail, those securities. Why is that important, Pastor Meyer? Because a lot of times you hold on to certain things and you depend on certain things to get you through. And when you do so, you fail to depend on the Lord. Boy, I sure hope somehow, Brother Mike, I've preached to somebody. I sure hope somebody, somebody needed to hear this. As every head is bowed and eyes closed. I've shared this, but I want to drive this point home. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed. It's very important for us to note the specific instructions that he gave them for this new chapter of their life. You see, each chapter of our lives will come with specific instructions. If we seek for them, we can find them. I don't believe you have to wander around aimlessly for another six months going, will it get any better? I'm talking to somebody. I feel this in my spirit. My Lord of mercy. You don't have to wander around for another three months wondering, is, is it going to get any better? Will there anything change? I, you don't have to go another four or five weeks thinking to yourself, I can't handle any more of this. Folks, I know how that feels. I'm opening up the altars tonight. And I'm letting the Holy Ghost give the invitation. If he's already drawing you, then, it, then you should come. If he's already tugging at your heart, you should find a place and pray right now. It doesn't matter what anybody else around you is doing. It doesn't matter if anybody else does pray or everybody in the whole church prays. Right now, you need to look at what's going on inside heart. What's going inside of self. What's going on inside of you right now. You say tonight, God, this new chapter of my life, I believe with all of my heart. As the pastor was preaching tonight, the Holy Ghost was dealing with me, Lord. Some things will stay the same, but there will be some things in my life that will change. You can't be molded and shaped into the image the potter wants the clay to be in unless you're pliable in the hands of the potter. Tonight, maybe you're going through some difficulties in your life, but you've allowed yourself to become bitter and hard. And God's been trying to mold you, but every time He tries to, you're so hard. And you won't allow the blood to soften you up so you're pliable in the hands of the potter. But tonight, let tonight be different. I said, let tonight be different. God, take me into the next chapter of my life, to the next place. I don't believe things have to be monotonous, come passing the same things over and over. I don't want to become lukewarm through all of this compassing. I understand sometimes, God, I may have to deal with chapter 2 and 3 to get to 4 and 5. But there are some of you tonight, when I started preaching this, you knew God was talking to you. You knew right away. You knew the Spirit of the Lord was speaking to you right away. You knew it instantly. It was as if God pulled your mail right out of the mailbox and started reading it right back to you. Because God's talking to you. 
tonight, Father, I love you and I praise you for this great opportunity to preach to your people, your bride. I ask you tonight to strengthen us as a body. Help us to embrace all the things that you choose to do with us in the next few weeks and months, God, to become the church, God, the living church, your bride. I pray, God, we'll do great exploits for the kingdom of God's sake. God, help us to storm the gates and be the church that we have not been as of yet. God, we've done great things in you, but I pray we'll do even greater. Lord, your word said that you would make your ministers as a flame of fire. I'm asking you to do that tonight in us, Lord. We're your ministers. We're your ambassadors. We're your children tonight, God. I pray that you'll help our families and our households. Oh, how we need it tonight. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm praying tonight, God, that you'll heal our minds and hearts, Lord, so that we can move on and do some greater things. We've already been through chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. Pieces of your puzzle had to come together to take us to the next place. I want to ask you a question while you're down on your knees. And I want you to think about this before you answer it within yourself. Do you feel like you're ready for the next chapter? Do you sincerely feel like you're ready for the next chapter? And if you are, and you really mean it, why don't you tell him tonight, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready. If that's you, you tell him, I'm ready. Take me to the king. Lead me down to the foot of the cross, the foot of the throne. God, I'm asking for the direction that's going to ensure that I stay in your will. God, mark my steps. This is a straight and a narrow way. And few there be that find it. I sure don't want to find myself walking too far to the left, too far to the right. But God, let my feet stay right in the middle of this narrow way. God, help me not to deviate from the plan of the master potter. God, tonight I'm asking you to talk to our heart. I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to us directly. Oh, I'm asking you tonight, God, let us crawl right up into the lap of God tonight. God, I pray that you'll let us put our head right on your chest, lay back and breathe. A sigh of relief to know everything's going to be all right. Everything will be all right. For that child of God that obeys the Lord, follows him perfectly, everything will be all right. Everything will work out as planned. I put my hand in the hand of the potter tonight. Lord, I pray that you'll help Brother and Sister Benefield to become greater, greater pillars in this church than ever before. Use their testimony for this younger generation. God, I pray. I pray that you'll use Brother Benefield in the Sunday school lessons to come that he'll teach. I pray, Lord, that his testimony, Lord, will affect this younger generation. Lamb of God, there are people that are down the altar praying, seeking your face. Some are so hungry. Some feel like it's a place of desperation that if something doesn't change, they don't know what they're going to do. I just pray, God, right now, open the heart. Open the ears. Pour in tonight in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. To the King. Oh, yeah. Don't have much to breathe. My heart's torn in pieces. It's my offering. Lay me at the throne. And leave me there alone. To gaze upon.
Take me to the King. Truth is, I'm tired. Options are few, and I'm trying. Speak to me, Lord. Speak to me, Lord. Let my ears be open, God, to hear the voice of the Lord crying out to me. What would you have me to do, Lord? You've come past this mountain long enough. Turn northward. Start climbing up. God said, I'm taking you to Canaan. I'll get you there if you'll just if you'll just listen to me. They weren't where they needed to be. They hadn't reached the goal. Canaan was a little farther up. Canaan was a little ways away. Maybe you're in a layover place right now. God said you've been there for a while because I was taking you somewhere else. But that layover place... It's time to, time to move. Time to move your spiritual feet. Time to get in the altar of prayer. Begin to move heaven with prayer. It's time to move. It's time to become active in the Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. God, I pray that I'll study. Get a hold of the Word of God. Let the Word of God get a hold of me tonight, Lord. Lord, my heart and my mind and my spirit and my ears are open. Talk to me if you would, Lord. We need a Many, many days. We can pass this mountain many days. We've been right here where we're at many days. They had been there so long, I guess they lost track of how many days it'd been. They said, we've been here a bunch of days. I don't know how many it's been. It's been many days. So tired of it. Lord, I just agree with Sister Benefield tonight for her daughters, for her children, her grandchildren, Lord, for her home, for her family. Lord, we bind the spirit of the enemy and we declare liberty over her household through the name of Jesus and by the blood of the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ. We plead the blood. We plead the blood right now. I just pray, God, those that have been idle, I pray, God, that they'll begin to move right now in the name of Jesus. God, to move closer to you. They haven't reached Canaan yet. They've been in a layover place for a while place where God said in the perfect timing I'm going to get you out of here when the timing's right I'm taking you to Canaan but you had to go through some things before I could get you there Sister Benefield I really 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 feel in my heart tonight that God is speaking Chapter 3, chapter 4. I can reminisce and thank God for the first two years, the third year. But Lord, if you should tear your coming, there'll be a fourth year. There'll be a fifth year. I don't expect you to do the same exact thing, the same exact way you did it in the first year, the second year, the third year. I want you to do what you want to do. I want you to open the doors you want open. I want to walk in those doors. You know, I was doing some thinking, folks, and I there are some people that are here tonight. I know Brother Benefield can concur with what I'm saying. But I realize tonight that we can reminisce about the days of old and the good things. And you know what I find that we sometimes do? We chase the greatest thing that ever happened to us. I want you to take a minute and think on that. It may be a little deep, but just... If there is a monumental experience in our 
in our walk with God, we tend to chase that feeling, chase that experience. I was watching something the other day, and they were talking about cocaine addicts and meth addicts, and they put them in a machine, and they measured their brain waves, and they talked about how that there were ex-cocaine addicts that had quit. But they put them in this CAT scan, I guess it was, and they showed them images of people that were raking the cocaine and slicing it and snorting it. And they watched the brain activity and the dopamine begin to just go crazy in their brain. Because what they did is their brain starts saying, hey, everything I associate that with was a great high, a great experience. And you know what? I started thinking to myself, you know, we as Christians... Sometimes I feel like that if we had some spectacular thing, maybe it was a ministry. I remember a time in my life, Brother Mike, I, my wife and my family, some of you that knew us, maybe my cousin, I don't know if she remembers back then, but we used to be really, really heavy into homeless ministry. So much to the point, there's some books back there, but that don't even tell a small portion of the story of the many days that I went into woods, made relationships and friends with people I'd never met, would bring food out to them, tents. We've, we, with the glory of God, we've done many, many things, and that was a great ministry. And you know what? Over the years, Brother Doug, I thought I felt guilty because I'm at a different chapter of my life, and I'm thinking I feel bad because I'm not doing that. But you know... I told Sister Tracy whenever she taught that lesson that also helped me along with many of the other things that God's been talking to me about. And I thought to myself, God's not asking me to live in 2005, 2006. Those are doors that God has already closed. And that's not to say that maybe one day in the future God may do homeless ministry. But God had to bring me through that chapter 3 of my life and learn a lot of things of compassion for the homeless people so that one day when I became a pastor for almost nine years in the same place, that I could know how to deal with people that have been through horrible situations. Look at this neighborhood we're in. I'm thankful tonight. And I said all that to say, you got to be careful not to keep chasing yesterday's good times and yesterday's experiences. It's good to think about revival and say, I'm ready to have another great revival. But I'm not asking God to do it exactly the same exact way, the same exact style, the same exact place. Sometimes God says, get up. You've been down at the brook Cherith. The brook sometimes I want to share something with you tonight it really means a lot to me it's a personal story but I remember being in a very difficult place in my life and I had invested and poured myself into this little storefront church we build and we you know how I do just building things and fixing stuff and we took a little empty shell of a building that was just a bunch of barely anything on the walls drywall the floor was all chipped up and just one empty space didn't even have a bathroom in it they told me that i couldn't get in it the owner of the of the business told me that nobody had been able they had multiple people that tried to rent it but when they went to the city hall they wouldn't let them do anything with it i said well i looked at him and i said you don't know my god he laughed in my face when i walked away i told my wife i said because he laughed at me i said watch what god does just because he laughed at me I went down to City Hall. It was on my birthday. I walked up to the desk. I took my little drawing of what I wanted to do. It wasn't no architect drawing. I took all that shop and drawing and different stuff in high school. And so I used my little bit of drawing skills and that. And I put it on paper. I said, this is what I want to do. I said, today's my birthday. And it would be a really good birthday present. I said, if you'll let me just get in here and do the work of the Lord over there. And that guy looked at me, Brother Ralph, and he said, so there are not going to be any load-bearing walls in there? I said, nope, I'm not going to build any load-bearing walls. I'm going to put a drop ceiling. I'm going to build the wall to the drop ceiling. We're not going to put no plumbing in the wall. The plumbing's already in the exterior wall coming in. I said, I'm going to put a commode on the hole that's in the floor. 
I said, we're going to build it bigger than a handicapped restroom would normally be. Ain't going to be no load-bearing nothing, no electrical in the wall or anything. He said, how many people are going to have in the parking lot? I said, right now, we ain't got nobody. He said, he laughed. He said, how many people you anticipate? I said, I don't know. We might have 12. We might have 35. He goes, well, I think there's enough parking for that. He said, okay. He stamped his approval. I went to that guy. I had the biggest smile on my face whenever I told him. I said, we got to prove he didn't believe me. I showed him the paper. I said, his signature's right here. He said, how did you do that? I said, I told you, you don't know my God. Well, that's wonderful. But you know what? We were there. We started out with nobody. We got about 45 people. We were seeing people save like crazy. I think we had 12 people save. We were preaching outside the place. We had like 12 people get saved in less than two weeks in a tent revival thing. We were doing Brother Travis Matt, and he was out there preaching, feeding the homeless, feeding people outside. And when it all came to a head and the enemy just stuck its nose right in the middle of everything, I, I've told this story, but I remember the day that I went up there to that church. I was all by myself, and I walked around, and I prayed, and I said, God, I don't know what to do because we had a family that was pretty substantial financially uh, as far as giving, and they were used to being Wesleyan Methodists, and if they couldn't have it their way and tell me how to pastor the church, they weren't going to be there. So they left, and when they did, they took a bunch of other folks with them. And long story short, we didn't have nobody. And so every month there for about two, two, three months, I was having to take money out of my own bill money to pay the rent. And I, I was falling behind on my own stuff, and I just couldn't keep doing it. I went to that church that's been a field, and I looked around, and I seen all the stuff. There was a platform. It was nice. It had an altar all the way around it. I seen all that stuff for what? I laid across the platform and I just looked up at the ceiling and I cried. I got pictures of my grandpa there. He was in service with me. He told me, I was preaching, he said, boy, when you came by me this morning, I could have sworn I saw one of your lungs hanging out your nose. (laughs) I'm just telling you all that, but you see, I didn't get stuck in that chapter of my life. Boy, God brought me through some rough stuff, and it's just made me better to where I am today. And I sure didn't want to be in that chapter, but I'm glad for where God's brought me from. And you can take that for what it's worth, because sometimes God has a different purpose. But this is the reason I told you that. I know I'm talking a lot tonight, but this is relevant. As I laid there across the platform, the Lord spoke to me and said, The brook has dried up. And as I laid there, I thought, what does that mean? The brook has dried up. And the Spirit of the Lord, I don't even, I'm one of those type of people, I can quote a lot of stuff from the Bible, but I may not always be able to tell you what the exact chapter and verse is. I don't even remember, I don't know where it's at. All of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Second Kings chapter 17, whatever it was. Gave me chapter, verse, everything. I'm like, what does that mean? So I got up, I went and got my Bible, I opened it up, and it was at the story, exact place I knew it was God because I couldn't remember that if I'd have tried they'd have hypnotized me and I couldn't remember that but it was a story about how that Elijah had gone down to the brook Cherith and the Bible said that God took him down there to sustain him and it said that there came a time when the brook dried up and you know I've preached from that text before because God brought that as a reality and I thought about this Mike he Elijah went out there day after day, and when a brook dries up, rarely does it just dry up instantaneously. Usually, that that little brook, Brother Eric, that might be three foot wide, you know, may go down to two foot wide, down to one foot wide. And I and I'm thinking to myself, he he probably knew that that brook was eventually going to dry up, but he went out there, and the Bible said it came to pass that the brook dried up, and Elijah's thinking like. What am I supposed to do? And God said, when the brook dried up, he said, arise and go to Zarephath because over there there's a little woman that's going to sustain you. And you know something? I'll tie all that into everything I've told you this, this evening. You know, there are places of our life, seasons and things. 
Don't ever become bitter at the season that you're in. Just thank God for the door that he may be about to take you in as long as you're willing to walk through that door. Bow your heads tonight. And I'm going to ask Sister Myers here to dismiss us in prayer. And I'm asking you, if you would, please remember my family in prayer. There's a lot of folks that are in need tonight. And um, matter of fact, once you stand to your feet, I want to do something because I forgot about this. It's